Hey everybody, welcome to a brand new Film Music Media Conversation. We have another collaboration spotlight for you here. Uh, my name is Kai Savas, and I want to welcome the amazing uh, Matt Novak, uh, composer Matt Novak, and uh, writer, producer, showrunner Dan Merck from Miracle Workers. Guy, Mer uh, Miracle Workers, I almost started off on a flub, but guys, so thank you so much for joining me tonight. It's so great to see you. Good to see you too. Thanks for having thank us. You, yeah. yeah, thanks for, thanks, glad to be here. Absolutely. Looking forward to it. So yeah, so uh, Miracle Workers, I mean, first of all, congratulations on the run of the show, four seasons of this amazing kind of quirky, unique, like awesome show, like just with a unique voice, unique tone, unique look, and uh, four seasons, uh, I mean, what a run, I mean, that's amazing, on linear TV these days, that's not a given, and you guys found an audience, and it's resonated with people, so I mean, it's such a awesome thing to see is something original like that kind of take off so I do want to you know before we kind of jump into Miracle Workers I want to kind of rewind and and let's learn about you two so like I'm curious uh what's uh, the history of your like collaboration and meeting so I mean you guys worked on Miracle Workers but it was this the first time you guys met on this show uh did you guys know before but yeah talk to, I guess, go back to the <laughs> beginning and how did you guys end up on the show together and working together what was like that first meeting like and who was there for, like Dan did you pick Matt. Yeah. Yeah. This was well this was the <laughs> first time that I'd worked with Matt was on this on the fourth season of uh, Miracle Workers. We'd never had a composer before. I'd never worked with a composer before. So Matt was like my my first uh, time and he was very gentle, very great. Um <laughs> and uh yeah, I mean we hired him because he came very highly recommended to us from uh, David Wayne, who he had worked with on Children's Hospital and what maybe some other shows too. Is that right, Matt? Yeah, Children's Hospital and Medical Police. Oh, and the uh, What Hot American Summer uh, Netflix series. Right. So he uh, he loved two, two, Matt and he was directing a couple of uh, episodes for us this season. And so he he uh, sang Matt's praises and that's how we got hooked up with him. And we really liked him right away and listened to a bunch of his previous work and felt like it was really right for the show this season in particular, um, which I guess we can get into later, but it's like in a post-apocalyptic world and Matt had done a bunch of stuff that sounded like it could fit that kind of genre. So, uh, so yeah. And then we just liked him personally too. So it was very easy to work with. Yeah. Oh, Matt, t t take us through like the the your your perspective. What was it like? like did you have to pitch for the show, or just a recommendation enough? Like, <laughs> you know, it was a it was a recommendation. Like, so many most of the jobs I get are from recommendations, either repeat clients or recommendations. Um, but I remember I got an email from the post producer Justin Pittman on like a Thursday or Friday, like, hey. David Wayne says you're great. We really recommended you join our show. Um, would you be interested and would you be available for a, a meeting over Zoom? This was still, uh, this was August or September of last year. Um, so we're still doing Zoom meetings. Um, they were still filming too. Yeah, um, we're still at the, time, at the end of filming, right? yeah. Yeah. Um, and so we scheduled the meeting and uh, Dan already knows this, but uh, the show had been on my list forever. Like so many of us, there's too many shows, too many films, our lists. Yeah. We'll never get through them. Yep. Um, and I heard it was great. Uh, my wife watched the first season. She's like, oh yeah, you should watch the show. And so, but anyway, we got that email. We set up a Zoom for like, I think that following Monday. And so my wife and I, we binged the first three seasons. Well, first two and a half seasons. We got through, we did not finish the season three before the week it was over. But um, yeah, so I, yeah. <laughs> I got a feel so for the show. you crammed and you watched it. I, I yeah. crammed, I crammed. <laughs> um, uh, I'm glad it was an, an anthology because it's like, I get one season down, I'm like, oh, I'm now that as, once I, as soon as I started the second season and realized it was a completely different storyline, I'm like, oh, great. I, I get the show. I, I, I understand the show. And then um, we had our interview over Zoom. Uh, it went really well. I was really happy with it. And uh, apparently you guys were too. Because um, I remember after it was over, like 
five minutes, it had been at least five minutes after the Zoom ended. I get a call from Justin. It's like, okay, we we want to hire you. Uh, like, yeah, um, we, we didn't. I never cool. even said, yeah, yeah like, <laughs> like, yeah, that's great. Yeah. So um, it was a, a a dream interview. I mean, it was, a, it was a dream reference, dream chat, meeting you guys. I think we clicked kind of immediately, and um, and that just went on from there. That's awesome. That was the beginning. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So, I mean, take, so, I mean, Miracle Workers is, uh, yeah, it's an amazing concept and, uh, you know, based on the writing of Simon Rich and, uh, you know, start with Miracle Workers season one and then uh, season two was Dark Ages, season three, Oregon Trail, and now season four was End Times. So, uh, yeah, I mean, Dan, Dan, take me back to the beginning and what attracted you to this project? Why did you personally want to be involved? What did it speak? What was it speaking to you? Like the, the writing of Simon and like, as a storyteller, why did you want to make this? And was it always going to be, uh, I guess, an, an anthology series? Or was it just like, let's try to get season one first and see where it goes? Or I'm just curious, what was like the, the all the way back at the beginning? <laughs> well, the beginning was Simon Rich, who you mentioned is, uh, you know, this, this great writer, if anybody's watching, he's an excellent uh, comedy writer. Uh, and he had, I had worked with him previously on an, on another show that he created called Man Seeking Woman. So mm -hmm. I worked on that show for three seasons with him and, uh, we, you know, got along really well, really liked each other. And so when he sold Miracle Workers to TBS, he brought me on right away as, as a writer and as, as a producing partner. And, um, the, the first season was based on a book that he had written called What in God's Name. Right. And he sold it originally, I think, just as that season, as just like a one-off um, sort of like mini series almost of just it's going to be based on the book. Um, but we got such a great cast together for it, including, you know, Daniel Radcliffe and then Steve Buscemi. Uh, and then oh, the rest of the cast is amazing too. Geraldine yeah. Viswanathan and Karin Soni and John Bass and Wally Adafobe, like we just ended up with this incredible cast. Um, and so when the first season ended, we had basically run out of book, you know, and, and so it was like, well, what are we going to do? And, you know, we have this great cast, we don't want to just like lose them. Um, let's and everybody loved working together. So let's like keep this going. Um, and so Simon, I, I think that it was basically, you know, the way Simon writes is he writes a lot of short stories and he he just don't jump from genre to genre a lot in his own writing. And so I think that the idea of uh, doing an anthology show that could jump from genre to genre every season was really attractive to him. I think it was also attractive to the actors because they get to stretch and play different roles every time. Yeah. And, you know, from a creative standpoint, uh, writing wise, it's also just really, really fun. Like you are creating new characters every season and uh, you know, you're not, you're basically not running out of material like you would for a lot of other shows. Like you, you kind of get to pack in all of your best Oregon Trail jokes into one season and then you never have to think about the Oregon Trail again and you can move <laughs> on to, you know, the, the apocalypse or whatever. Um, so yeah, it was, it was just a really, it was just a very, it was weird. It was a very weird show, a very weird concept for a show. I think that the anthology nature of it is uh throws a lot of people off you yeah. know especially if they love the first season and then they get to the end of it and they're like all right more hijinks in heaven and then they realize actually no the second season's in the dark ages and there's no explanation given and there's no connective tissue whatsoever <laughs> so it's just it asks a lot of the audience um but i think the people that are into it really like it and kind of uh they like you know, they like how strange it is and they like that it jumps around and they, and I think it's also fun to be able to follow the actors, you know, through these different roles and through these different um, settings. Um, so, yeah, I, I don't know. It's, it was just, it was, that's how I basically came to the show and that's why I like the show. And it was, yeah. it was a very fun run for sure. And also just, I mean, crazy to get to work with that level of talent in the cast. Like, I mean, I can't believe I got to work with like, Radcliffe and Buscemi and everybody else for for four seasons it was like a dream come true truly um, it was a, it's very I mean you cool. meant I mean it is an anthology you've mentioned there's no connective tissue because you know I think anthology series definitely picked up after American Horror Story and that kind of like really showcased like oh yeah we can do this we can keep like 
to each season be fresh and new new viewers can come in and then explore the other seasons and go with whatever order they want um but even with you know something like american horror story and even fargo i've talked to you know jeff Rousseau and talk about how he works with noah holly and and there they definitely have like they try to do connective tissue but each thing is still the same so was it like was it a challenge to make sure that like it to make a series but each i guess each season was kind of its own standalone thing that that how do you create like a, a content i mean a continuation and for fans to come back and is there any kind of connective tissue or is it really just like the I connective guess the theme tissues would be Simon, right simon's like tone and his right yeah right? it's more like the connective tissues are more in terms of the tone and the themes that are being covered usually it's every every season is usually about a group of likable characters who are stuck in a hellish world i would say that's kind of how i would boil it down like it's always like uh, a group of characters that are just trying to do their best and get along and be good to each other and they're stuck in some kind of horrific environment um, that's why we were attracted to the Dark Ages. That's why we were attracted to the Oregon Trail and the Apocalypse. Like, it's always fun to put these people into just the worst settings we could think of. Um, <laughs> and, <laughs> and then there's also some, you know, there's some repeated story elements that we kind of did intentionally, like Geraldine's character and Dan's character fall in love time and time again. Like that's what happens in the first three, basically every season is them falling in love over and over again. The fourth season, we start them off in a relationship at the beginning, um, but it's still about them kind of like at the, at their core. Um, but otherwise, yeah, there's no, there's really no threading through at all. There were lots of times it, we talked about it. We talked about many different ways that we could thread it through, especially in the most recent season. Like there would have, there's all sorts of opportunities to like, you know, they go into a virtual reality and you see in that virtual reality, all of these different lives that they could have played out, you know, and we see that like the, the middle, middle ages and the Western theme and like the heaven are all part of that or something like that. But yeah. it just never really felt like what the show was or like it, interesting to us really like on any level, the show is really just a sweet kind of comedy show yeah. at its core and and the character stories are all pretty distinct. And so we we never really felt like people are coming to this show for some kind of overarching, you know, connective, like, uh, you know, connected universe type thing. Absolutely. Um, well, so, yeah, it was kind of part of the fun was keeping it all separate. Yeah, for sure. Well, let's uh, jump into to music. So, Matt, like, what were the first do you remember the first discussions you had with Dan like what were the, what was like the starting point for I guess the conversation of music like when did you come in to uh to production like was it early was it kind of in post I'm curious like what was the starting point for you and what were kind of those first talks about music about yeah we actually touched on it a little bit during my interview like they they talked to uh uh Dan and the other kosher owner Robert Badnick uh, we're talking about how this last season was apocalyptic, but also kind of Mad Max inspired. And they're going kind of like a 80s VHS vibe for like the whole show. So we talked a lot about synths, uh, being more synth focused. Um, that's something that they really wanted. That was the idea that they had. Um, and Talked a lot about like John Carpenter, yeah. I think, like yes. John Carpenter music. And yes. yeah, like pulling a lot of references from those, you know, Mad Max, Escape from New York. Um, exactly. exactly. Of movies. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, I'm like, do we talk about other things? This was like <laughs> over a year ago. Um, <laughs> but yeah. And I, uh, and then when, when we started actually working on the show, um, The, it was like right after they wrapped uh, shooting and just getting into the edits. I think they had a maybe a rough cut of the first episode, um, but I knew they wanted synths and um, you know Mad Max vibe. Um, I know Mad Max has all 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 the Mad Max films have a lot of big orchestral stuff, but we know we we didn't really actually want that. Right. Um, just like. Uh, the general like 80s 
five. Um, and the nice thing about this show is that we spent, I wanna say the first month, maybe two months, uh, just working on the tone of the score, uh, or like the, the, the palette, of the score. Um, I did a few rounds of themes. Um, like my first, my first round was the synths were a little bit too modern. Like I was like more mm -hmm. like modern eighties rather than eighties, eighties. Uh, and that's when I, you know, I really started digging into more John Carpenter and Giorgio Moroder. And then I, I, I like to, uh, I started calling it clean synth versus dirty synth. I know that's I not, that. that's not correct. I'm sure probably some composers are going to get upset with me for saying that, but it's more <laughs> just like, you know, it was obvious when the synths were too modern. So it's yeah. like, it was a, you know, too wide stereo, wide, too clean, too bright. Um, so I think once I, once we hit on that tone of like going for Marauder and Carpenter, that kind of more distortion, um, more saturation, more mono, uh, or you know, mono with delays and reverb to kind of space things out that way rather than having a stereo synth. Um, then it really kicked into gear. Uh, I was also uh, inspired by the score to Mad Max Beyond Thunderdome, which uh, you know I hadn't listened to in year for years. Like really, uh, and I remember this, and it like that's an orchestral score. But it also had like sort of Planet of the Apes ish percussion, yeah. Yeah. like really kind of junky percussion. And I'm like, all right. Steve Buscemi plays a junk dealer. There's a, a junkyard is a key location in this show. And so that, I was like, so then it became like this, did a lot of, you know, junky percussion, some of it samples, some of it real. Um, and uh, yeah, but I think it all kind of clicked, clicked together. That, and there are also, there are episodes that do parodies. So there are some orchestral, uh, sample programming as well but the core sound of the show is since uh, yeah chunky per yeah. percussion i think one of the one of the challenges with this season and one of the reasons that we needed a composer was because the kind of music that we were looking for didn't really exist it was kind of it was like apocalyptic 80s genre music the right. sounds like that but that also needs to fit a sitcom you know like yeah. a light goofy sitcom so like there needs to be a, a love theme for instance or there needs to be a theme for like what if they're just like hanging out in bed like having a goofy conversation about like what they're reading or you know having to go to the supermarket the next day you just need kind of like light background music for some scenes like that which aren't really in the palette of a John Carpenter movie mm -hmm. or a Mad Max you know so it kind of needed to be something that sounded like it could exist in that world, but also could exist in a, in a sitcom about a domestic couple, you know? So that's that's why we needed to bring in somebody like Matt who could kind of meld those two worlds and create a sound for us that like we just had not really heard before. Yeah. Um, all the other seasons we did were a lot easier in terms of like our third season was a Western and there's a ton of Western library music to pull from to fit any kind of mood you, you need. And so that, that was easy. And then same with the medieval season, there's a lot of medieval music that you can really plop into almost anything. Um, so it was, this season was really like a particular challenge and we kind of knew right away that we were going to need a composer. Yeah. Um, so we tried for a minute what, to do yeah, it. What with made like you library. want to, I, because yeah, because I feel like there's certain <laughs> shows that can really get, get by on library music. Like I think, especially with comedy, like I think it's always sunny is a perfect example of like finding the a tone of a show th through a kind of royalty free of libraries and stuff like that. But and when, once you're at season four and you go, wait, we really need, you know, somebody to like craft something. What, what about this season? I guess spoke to you, Dan, that was like, we need to reach out to somebody like Matt and find a storyteller to, to collaborate with like that. I think it was just really the needle we were trying to thread was uh, was not going to be threadable with 
uh, library music. Like yeah. we just, we, we could have spent, you know, hours and hours trying to dig through all sorts of like library tracks that, that would maybe sound synthy and grungy, but also light enough that they could play, play in the background of like a goofy comedy scene, but it would just have, it would have been really hard. And I don't think the sound would have been consistent. And so we just needed somebody to kind of create a lot of it, uh, a lot of it for us. So that was that was where Matt was super helpful. Yeah. Well, yeah. Matt, you you have the you have the 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 honor of replacing the library composer. <laughs> right. I'll take it. <laughs> Not the I other see. way around, where a real composer gets replaced by a library. <laughs> uh, I actually, my first job out of college, I worked for a composer, assistant for a composer that had started his own library. So like I started in the library world. So it's it was like I got my revenge. <laughs> uh, but uh and you know it's like dan mentioned like sifting through library tracks trying to find like the perfect stuff we even had you guys even had a fantastic music supervisor in rob lowry mm -hmm. and a an incredible music music editor in nate hill like <laughs> like those guys yeah. couldn't find the right stuff I like, mean, they, I mean, they could, they're the best. I mean, they're they probably, really, yeah. yeah, but it would just take forever and it just wouldn't yeah. be as efficient and it wouldn't be, I, I don't think we would ever be able to find like a bunch of song, you know, hours of songs that all fit that same tone and like all yeah. feel just right. It felt cohesive, um, I think. I think the thing that what Matt could bring is that kind of unified vision, I think, as a composer, as a storyteller. And Matt, I'm curious, you know, you, you talked about all the elements of the inspiration of different genres and different, you know, decades and stuff, but did you find it easy to, to kind of put your stamp on it too? So like, I, I don't want to just like take other people's, you know, you know, styles and kind of, but you were able to, I mean, at least for it to be creatively rewarding for you to kind of put your voice as a composer. I'm sure it must've been fun to, to kind of channel all those styles and then create it and then kind of like find your voice through it too. Yeah, I, it was fun. I always liked doing that. And I think that, um, it, I think comes from like I have I built a career on doing lots of parodies. Yeah. So I always find it a nice challenge to like I'll get a parody, like okay, like this is Mad Max, or like we're parodying. There's a, I'm thinking of a different show, or like we're parodying The Fugitive. Here we're we're gonna attempt with James Newton Howard's fantastic score, and they are like, oh yeah, do a parody of that. Okay, but it's like getting the challenge of kind of studying that original music, original score, kind of breaking it down, figuring out how to text, and then doing my spin on it. It's like, it's, it's always a fun challenge to kind of like, it's another threading the needle. Like it's like you do a parody, you make your own, but it still should be still kind of a parody on something. Yeah. Um, so that's always been, that's always, I always really enjoy doing that. And I always end up learning something too. Like I, I find I learn more when I try to break down a piece of score and then try to do my spin on it. But this was nice because it was a mix of that, but also it still, we weren't directly parroting any specific piece of score. There are a couple of episodes where we, there's a, you know, the second episode is a, has a Dune parody. So I, I did sort of reference that. I didn't knock it off specifically but like i listened to that score and try to like kind of uh inject that vibe to it but um that was nice because I, I listened to it you know a few different things like you know john carpenter i, I think there's another uh, george R. Maroder. I, I think i listened to uh some other synth stuff too and just like kind of getting a feel for it and then yeah just you know i think playing a my own stamp on it that way uh, i should say our own stuff because i have a i have a team yeah. uh uh my frequent collaborator greg martin uh um is, is a fantastic composer composer too and guitar player um so uh, i should say we uh yeah just it, it was fun to kind of like just parody or, or reference a style 
like the yeah just, you're you're finding like, like the the style the the, the yeah the tone yeah. of the feel like i mean my favorite scores are i mean some of my favorite scores are parody scores and i'm talking my, my parody version of parody though is like i grew up with the zucker the abram stuff you know so you have stuff like airplane stuff like you know naked gun like mm -hmm. it's like those scores just kind of pull from a genre but also become their own thing too and then even modern yeah. parodies like Tropic Thunder, I thought, you know, the, what Teddy did there, Shapira, like it was just brilliant. It was very kind of Black Hawk down, but it still felt like, you know, it was, you can, it's an action score on its own, but within the context, it's like brilliant. But like, yeah, but, exactly. but I'm sure for, for finding like, um, but yeah, but for, for, uh, for Miracle Workers, what's the starting point for you? So did you, when you're scoring an episode, are you getting locked picture? Or are you starting like, like previously in the edit with and have to do some conform so i'm curious dan when you bring matt in and when does that scoring process start on from episode to episode i believe we brought you in before we had even locked cuts right we were showing yeah. you especially for the first one we were definitely showing you like rough cuts and kind of getting you accustomed to what the show was and having those initial conversations about what the tone was going to be. And then I think maybe as we went along, we would give you cuts that were closer to being done just so that you could kind of, um, you know, fit it a little bit more closely. But I think in the beginning it was, you were, you were brought in pretty early and yeah. we, yeah, we, uh, I, I remember just like really needing to, yeah, we really wanted to get like a bunch of those themes figured out pretty quickly. What's the romance theme? What's the like, you know, Freya, Freya has like, uh, the Geraldine Viswanathan character, like she has, uh, you know, she's a warlord occasionally. I mean, she's always a warlord, but occasionally she slips into like warlord mode where we needed this really scary kind of like, you know, percussive be like you know she's gonna come kill you song with like a wailing <laughs> guitar and that was cool uh that was a fun thing to work on with Matt because like you're saying it is a it is kind of a parody like it's a parody of like the evil you know the evil bad guy song when like the big badass shows up in a movie but it's not like so far over the top you yeah. know it's only like slightly like 10 percent crazier than it like really would be and I think that's that's like a really hard line to hit but you always managed oh. to hit it was like how do you make it a kind of a joke but you're also still honoring the the reality of the situation it's like when she, when she shows up and we play that theme like we do want it to be that she is scary even though she's also being kind of goofy and like yeah. lifting Dan Radcliffe up by his neck and punching him like a thousand times in the face <laughs> you know? yeah. well I remember that theme uh I feel like my first pass had too much going on. Mm -hmm. Like it, it had like punning drums, guitars, uh, arpeggiating synth, which was too clean because that was part of my first pass. Um, and then we pulled it, once Once we pulled it back, uh, then I added some like grunts to it. Uh, still oh some yeah, guitar. yeah, the yeah. grunts was a big part. Uh -huh. The like chanting, ooh, ah, ooh, yeah. ah, yeah, that was great. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, and then like, but like, you I remember when I first started working, I was sent a rough cut of the first episode, and then I used that to write my the themes. Um, so I did a few different passes of that, um, and uh, I think only one of my first versions actually. Oh no, maybe two. Two of my first versions actually made it into the uh, final show, but the rest of kind of got reworked and. Um, yeah. which is great with collaboration like that's like yeah. I love I I'm a I feel like I'm a rare composer that actually likes getting notes <laughs> because like that's collaboration you know and it's um so it's like I, that and it was it was so nice to have such a cushion baked into the uh, start of the project that we could work on these things we can get it right and really like hone things down yeah um and then once the uh, mixes start happening, then the schedule was a little fast and furious. But we had already, it, it really wasn't, um, it was already, we were already on a roll, you know, so mm -hmm. it, it, it wasn't that. And uh, yeah, once you got those like original themes worked out, it was, we could be a lot more efficient with the later episodes because we would just be like, okay, here's a place for the love theme to go. Okay, here's Ty, let's throw in his theme. Like, it was less like inventing the wheel every time. 
Yeah, yeah exactly. Matt, well, did, did yeah. you have like, did, did, Dan, did you give Matt the entire, I mean, I think you watched a few episodes, but did you have the whole season arc? Did you know exactly how it was going to end when you started? So you were able to map things out or did you kind of react episode by episode and just kind of like, oh, I have my themes from from episode one. I know what to, to kind of place here. Or did you kind of build it out? <laughs> We'd finished uh, the whole season oh, shooting wise, but I don't think you'd seen the whole thing, right? No. Like, yeah. No, I think... Gosh, it's just so like so long ago. Uh, <laughs> um, I think I know a few episodes were a surprise. I know episode six got reshuffled, so I didn't see that till like later. Um, and I remember working on episode nine and going, "Oh, I guess the finale is a, a big robot versus humans war." Okay. <laughs> All right. All right. That's going to be a big one. That's going to be a big one. Okay. <laughs> but I think, you know, um, I think you guys are pretty good at like, give me a heads up on any like story beats um, that would come, come up later mm -hmm. um, in the season. Um, but yeah, but other than a couple of examples, like, I think I was pretty much going episode by episode. Um, I kind of like learning learning the story as we went along but i had a it wasn't a total surprise yeah i'm, I'm curious dan like i mean i mean you mentioned uh matt that you kind of you when you your first pass might have been like too too much and you had to kind of reel back so i'm curious dan as a showrunner as a director uh, as a writer and producer i'm curious like when you're working with a composer do you love it when your composer like just bats for the for the bark and then you reel it back or or, or do you prefer someone who kind of starts and gets a little bit here and they're like no let's let's go kind of meet me here or versus pull back here i'm curious what you prefer from a i guess from a show running standpoint um i guess i i guess i'm generally more in the camp of swing for the fences first yeah, yeah. do something crazy and then kind of pull it back if that's not working um yeah i mean i guess uh one thing about working with a composer is that uh like you you know, from my perspective, I don't know anything about music and my right. co-showrunner also doesn't know anything about music. And so a lot of our notes to Matt are very vague <laughs> at best. Mm -hmm. Like it's very much just like, well, we want it to be light and sort of like plucky, but uh, but that'll be it. Or like, we kind of want it to go like up more here or something like that. And just very, very like general and vague. And so it's very helpful um, to work with somebody like Matt, who's patient with us and, you know, listens to all of our rambling, like bad notes, and then is able to translate them into something good, you know, and, and yeah. to work with us and to figure out like what we're even asking for, which is sometimes half the battle, you know, like even just figuring out what we want is sometimes kind of hard. Um, but that's why it's yeah it's nice to work with somebody who's like just cool and easy to work with uh, I love, like Matt. yeah i love that because i think i mean to matt's credit to all composers it's like, i get i feel like you guys are the you are the, the therapists and you're also uh, the the translators because like yeah i mean i think it might be worse for you matt if you had a composer that would be like all right move this bar down here and i know if, if, if you're if that you know director was also the compo uh, composer and musician like i've heard that you know, Terrence Malick apparently is a nightmare because he knows music and he'll kind of like tell mm. composers, uh, like each composer who's worked with Terry Malick has always had like a story about, about let's do <laughs> everything in this bar or that. So I'm curious for you, I'm sure it must be a challenge to also, you know, kind of like, I want it to be like this here. And then you have to then go, okay, now I know what that means in musical terms, but I'm, I'm sure you've built over your course of your career, you kind of can speak director now or speak <laughs> writer or showrunner. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I think that just comes from experience, but I always like, I always prefer, and I, I'm sure I brought this up during spotting or something or during review sessions, but I always prefer when collaborators don't, I always tell them, like, don't try to speak it the music. If you have, if you have yeah. references, you want, if you want to mention a score you like that you think would work, that's fine. But our common language is story and emotion. Just yeah. to, tell me what emotion you want. If if it's if I get the wrong emotion, if you want it to be, if it's too angry, you want it to be a little bit more sweet, or 
something like that. Stuff like that is perfect because that's that's our common language. Um, and uh, you know, I try to be. I pride myself. I I try to like understand story, how story works, and how to like add music to it. But uh, I don't get it perfectly all the time. You know, so it's yeah. like if I miss the story, if it does, if the cue needs to do something different in order to help tell the story, that's 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 that. Those are the kind of notes I like. That's kind of direction. Yeah, that's the part of the process, I like. and that's the back yeah. and forth I think between you two. I mean, that's the important connection of communication throughout production and. And it's all in service of what the story is. And I think that's the beautiful, that's why I fell in love with filmmaking because it's like, okay, you, you, you're, everyone has their like field of expertise, you know, whether you're a writer or a DP or a production designer, or you're in the, you know, an AD or you're running stuff on set making work, or you're the mu musical story. I mean, everyone is just contributing. And I think I, even though I love kind of the idea of an auteur theory and like, this is somebody's film, but I always feel like it's a collective vision. It's like everybody's collective vision. And what you're seeing on the screen is everybody's input. And it's just like, this is our show and our film or whatever, you know. And I think that really comes across with Miracle Workers because it's like this collective, you know, creative, like, you know, pool of amazingness. So <laughs> I think it speaks <laughs> to, I think just, and it's funny because I'm sitting here, you know, I'm talking to you two together for the first time, but it feels like you, there's no, there's no like, I'm the boss and this is, it's like, you guys are just feel like so friendly and relaxed. And like, so I feel like I'm sure it must've been. Oh, Dan's blast. the boss. Dan's <laughs> the boss. I guess technically, but technically, you know, in I'm, this I'm, realm, in the realm of music though, like you're the boss, like, cause I, I don't know <laughs> shit, you know? <laughs> well, looking yeah. back at the entire, uh, I guess the entire fourth season, like, was there a, a, a particular moment throughout production that you kind of remember as something very creatively rewarding, whether it was like getting that first locked picture or was it like for Dan, for you, whether it was like, have, I mean, it can be from the first script or being on set or whatever, I'm curious, or hearing the first finished score. I'm curious if there's like a moment that kind of sticks in your brain. That's like, I really remember that. And that really stands out. That kind of means a lot to me. So I'm curious. Oh man. Like, I mean, so many, basically any day that you're on set, you're, I mean, with this show in particular, you're like seeing something crazy and that you can't even believe all these people have gotten together to create. Like, for instance, there was one episode where we have Dan Radcliffe riding around on a big, on a huge man's shoulders. It's like kind of like Master Blaster from um, Beyond Thunderdome where he has like his new car is essentially like a huge jacked man with like a diving helmet on and he rides him around and he rides on his shoulders and so like i remember we came up with that idea we thought it was so funny and then i remember like drawing a picture of like what i thought it should look like and then handing that picture off to our costume designer and our, our props uh department and they actually created something that looked almost exactly like what i'd drawn and I, that was just when you can see something like that happen in real in reality, where you're like, "This was a crazy, stupid idea," and here we are, the best talent in the business is making it happen, <laughs> and it's like actually happening right in front of you. You can't even believe that like it yeah. came from your head and it's like now real. And then obviously, like the the uh, like you were talking about how collaborative it is and everything like that, and that's true. And I, another really fun moment was just watching the the first cut of the episode with with the whole crew oh, yeah. on our last day of filming um cuz everybody had poured so much into it through the whole season you know every department and it's, so it was so fun to get to just watch it with everybody and have everybody see their work on the screen and uh and get to cheer and laugh along with it and so that was a really great moment too just getting to watch it with everybody yeah, um absolutely. but yeah almost every day was was something fun and crazy though <laughs> uh -huh. yeah for matt for you what was like what, for you on your your journey on this on this project what was some what kind of something that stuck out for you you know i i think my well working on the show uh getting the job uh <laughs> <laughs> um so many things like meeting dan and the rest of the the crew um like I made new friends on this show. Like I, if, and it's just, I loved working with everyone. Um, and it, it just seems like I, as I learned, like everyone on the show, no matter their job, they're fantastic. They're all great people and they do, and they love work on the show. And it, 
I think that even comes across on the show. You could tell that people are having fun making the show. But I think I think my favorite uh, was when it was all done. I, I couldn't go to the mixes because like once it started mixing, it was we were mixing like a, you were like still working on episodes while we were mixing or something like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, like and there, it, there, it was not quite two episodes a week. Maybe like two episodes every week and or an episode every week and a half or something. I think we were mixing um, two a week. Anyway, yeah, you're two week. Okay, yeah. Again, uh, we've already established that my memory is shot. <laughs> no, um, <it's> <laughs> uh, but uh, I was, yeah, we're still working, still writing, still doing revisions, you know, printing stems, uh, mixing. Um, but I couldn't go to the mix. Then I finally got to the go to the mix of the season the final episode, and that was just. I always love doing that, uh, yeah. no matter what show. But it was so great to like see that final episode, uh, just watch it. Uh, John Chamberlain, the mixer, it's fantastic. Fantastic mixing. The mix is, uh, I watched the show on, you know, on TV like the rest of us. And the mixes were great. Uh, they're fantastic. Um, but yeah, Why do you just, think so? I'm always so worried that like it sounds good in the room, but then it doesn't come through on TV, you know? Yeah, like, because I, I'm it's always funny so worried about I always, that. I always like joke when I go visit a composer in the studio, like I'm, if I'm friends with them, I'll go sit in the studio, watch them work. And I'm like, you have like a million dollars worth of equipment here. And then someone's going to be like with their earbuds and just like, you know, like, yeah, and it's like everything there. The it's like watching on their yeah. phone instead of like Dolby Vision or HDR. <laughs> <It's> like... Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Um, and yeah, I, there have been shows I worked on where I I always feel like the music could be louder, but uh, this it turned out really well. It turned out really well, I think. Um, but yeah, that was a such a great way to kind of wrap up yeah. the show. And uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, I guess to to kind of wrap things up uh, our conversation, uh, you know, uh, we talked kind of about your this specific uh, you know show that you guys worked on and the, your guys' creation. Uh, but, you know, we were talking before we started recording that, yeah, our industry is going through a massive shift right now. Uh, we're very grateful that SAG got their deal and that hopefully people can get back to work. But as the times are changing and viewing habits are changing and linear is changing and streaming is changing, I'm curious from your perspective as professionals in the industry, what are some of the good things that are happening right now that are really good and some of the things that maybe we still need to like look at and work on and pay attention to? So I'm curious from your perspective from being, you know, in this industry for so many years i'm curious like what are the changes that are good and what are some that maybe we should pay attention to a little bit more so dan i wanted you to oh wow that's a big question um i mean obviously in terms of good things that are happening i think it's really good that these two union uh, actions have resulted in I think, you know, better deals for a lot of workers. Yes. And I think that that's great. And I hope that that is, um, you know, I would say one of the bigger problems. Well, I mean, this is not specific to the entertainment industry, but it's just sure. the kind of imbalance of wealth of just, you know, there's certain yeah. people at the every top. Every sector making... is seeing it. I mean, we're seeing auto workers going on strike, UPS, like it's happening every every industry. Yeah. Yeah. So that's that's a big one. And obviously, like, I hope that that, that some of that shifts even further down too. So it's not just like writers and actors who are making more money, but that everybody can can start sharing in, in more of the money, you know, in, in all parts of the industry. Um, and I don't know, I, I, yeah, I, in terms of, I don't know, it just seems like it's such an uncertain time right now. It feels like it's gonna be a really rocky few years as people kind of figure out what the new landscape looks like from right from my our perspective right now you know it looks like there's going to be a lot of cutting back that's going to happen there's going to be a lot of uh you know a lot fewer shows made and a lot uh yeah just a lot of cuts across the board budgets are going to be lower i don't i don't think we're going to see as many like risks being taken on big you know like 
wheel of time style shows or whatever yeah. like like billion dollar shows that uh absolutely yeah like it seems like those days are kind of over and i don't know i'm hopeful that maybe if things get back to sort of you know back to earth a little bit with like budgets and stuff personally i don't mind smaller budget stuff that has you know lesser known people attached as long as the ideas are good and like the writing is good that's what matters most to me and um so I'm um, yeah I'm I'm hopeful that like I, I don't know there will always be cool people out there making cool stuff and I I I don't think that's gonna yeah, I think we'll always so. there'll always be that like I it's funny I always think that I feel like that middle ground that mid-tier like 80 60 80 million dollar movies was coming back I think right before the pandemic hit and then everything kind of just kind of oh no it but I, it, it is true like not every movie has to be 250 million dollars and make a billion dollars to be a success I feel like we need to and I think a show like yours like Miracle Work is such a perfect example of something that's so unique and and quirky and fun and different that still resonates and can you know run for four seasons and have an audience and have fan base and and it's it's not gonna you know it's not some giant Marvel DC thing, but it's like you have an awesome cast and and you can look back at this and it's gonna be like and I think people go back and I think a lot of the younger people are finding kind of the old stuff now you know for kind of pushing back all these IP and franchise things and looking back at the 90s and 80s and seeing like what was 70s being done and I I'm, I think I feel like cycles happen I think we'll get back to that so yeah for sure. Yeah, as long as people can still find the shows, that would be one thing that I that I am worried about is, yeah. uh, you know, all these streamers just taking stuff off and then it's just kind of disappeared it forever. forever. Yeah, and I'm, I'm, so, I have a giant okay. wall of Blu-rays. I'll always be a physical guy, like, you know. Cool, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's the way. That's the yeah. way for sure. Yeah. Matt, for you, from your perspective, from the music world, what's uh, what are some <laughs> great things happening and what are some things? I know you guys are a little bit more... <laughs> in the wild west because you don't have a union and it's like i feel like composers yeah that you know of course ai is still a threat for uh, for you guys as well so I'm, I'm curious from your perspective like what are things that are that you love that's going on right now what are things that are i guess keeping you up at night a bit <laughs> oh <laughs> uh geez i i don't there's still like fantastic scores being written yeah and uh, uh, just the like things that I, I just really get inspired by um and like Dan said, there's still there's still cool people making cool things. Um, so that's we're gonna keep doing it. It's but yeah, I it'd be great if we had a union. Um, AI is a little scary. Um, I don't. Yeah, I don't know. It, it's tough because like we're always the last. I would be interested to see now that the strikes are over and things start picking back up, what is what is this new era that's just starting now? Yeah. What's it gonna look like when composers get hired on these shows in this new era, whatever it ends up being? Um, I know you know, music budgets have been shrinking. For decades, forever. yeah. Where I think, yeah, forever. Um, and uh, so it's, I. So I, I, I'm a little worried that's going to shrink even more. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's, uh, and there's, there's something to a challenge. I think you know, speaking, you know, like lower budget or mid budget films. There's something to like the challenge of using your budget wisely so i can hope there's more of that um there were through through the whole industry you know and just not you know cutting costs for cost's sake but like cutting costs in a wise way yeah. and then using that I'm money sure that, i mean there has to be yeah. flagrant like overspending clearly on these big movies oh, that are just like yeah money just draining in different pools of area you know and just like oh yeah this now it's 200 million dollars like what why <laughs> like it's just like yeah exactly <laughs> um yeah but anyway i'm sorry i don't really have an answer um no that's that's totally fine i think what you pointed out was is is i mean yeah i think it I think it's always I think it's it's always going. I think we we're always just always adapting with change and I think especially yeah. people our age are kind of coming into our, you know, getting to make our shows now and getting to work on things. It's like, you know, we're kind of following in from the boomers like kind of moving out of the way, but it's like we're we get to I think the exciting part is we get to kind of define 
hopefully we get to have a say in what this new landscape is and and we're always just working i guess within what the confines are because it's like if this changes then we make it work it's like okay if budget shrinks we'll make it work and that's the, what i love about la and being here it's like you know I've, i i i moved to the east coast for two years during the pandemic like i'm leaving la it's too expensive Ugh. but i came right back because it's like i had a two you know four bedroom house over there come back to my apartment here but it's like i want to be here and it's like I don't want that. I want to create stuff. And it's like what we love to do. And I just love talking with people with you because it's like, we're so passionate about it. And like, you can feel the passion and it's like, and then you see what, what, what a great show can do, go out in the world and touch people and connect people. And then we get to talk about the human condition and what's funny and scary and loving. It's like, and I think that will always win forever. So yeah, <laughs> so. that's a good, yeah, I, I agree. Yeah. <laughs> 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 well, uh, guys, thank you so much for your time this evening. It has been such a thrill to to dive into your process and and see your guys' dynamic and then learn about your process and how you guys do your jobs and everything. So, yeah, thank you so much for for sharing and, and giving us all the insight. It's been such a blast. It's really yeah. fun. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Kaya. Yeah, it's been fun.